scientist here in the department, and I'm also the executive director of the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. So this um, colloquium today is co-sponsored by the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. We're a multi-institution um, initiative seated here at UC Berkeley and composed of eight universities and five national labs working to train the next generation of nuclear security experts. So if you're interested in research and development in nuclear security and non-proliferation, please um, reach out, learn more about us, visit our website, nssc.berkeley.edu. It's my great pleasure to um, announce Naomi Marks. Naomi is a nuclear forensic scientist from Lawrence Livermore National Lab and she's a geologist by training. And so um, I think that that's important to know because um, sometimes you think, how do these people get to have these really cool jobs like being nuclear forensic scientists? And they do things like nuclear engineering PhDs and geology PhDs. Um, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Naomi who's gonna tell you more about her background and her work. Excellent. Well, thank you, and I, I really liked that in your introduction you emphasized the geologist, so that should tell you all a lot about me. Um, that's my background. I came to the National Lab from UC Davis. I did my PhD at UC Davis in geochemistry. I studied geothermal systems, and um, so the places that those show up are in Iceland and Hawaii. So as a grad student, I got to go to Hawaii seven times and Iceland three times, and then I took a job in a National Lab and working in nuclear forensics that does not have trips to Hawaii and Iceland, but it turns out I still like my job. So. <laughs> um, I like to start with this picture because this is this is a it's a hoax radioactive bomb that was found actually on Hopkins Street right outside Monterey Market, and this is a picture from Berkeley side. So look, it's it's a real sort of thing. Um, how many people think it would be illegal to make something like that leave in a bus station if it didn't have any rad material? It doesn't have any rad material? No. Apparently not. It's not illegal in this country. In many countries in the world, just possessing something radioactive, if you're not supposed to have it, that, that counts as illegal. Um, but, a, but a hoax is not, and they can't prosecute. Okay, so I want to get started um, with a couple of assumptions upon which nuclear forensics is founded. The first is that illicit, radi illicit trafficking of radioactive and particularly nuclear materials is uh, problematic and poses a serious threat to the, the international community. A second assumption is that these materials, due to their radiotoxicity and also to the nuclear proliferation risks, can cause a considerable threat if they're diverted. And finally, um, that it is possible to identify nuclear forensics indicators that can uh, track the consistency of a state's declarations with its, um, with its nuclear materials. Or actually, okay. So what's nuclear forensics then? It's the examination of nuclear or other radioactive materials or evidence contaminated with radionuclides in the context of legal proceedings typically under international or national law related to nuclear security. So, there's a lot in that statement, and that's kind of the boilerplate statement that comes from uh, well, it's consensus by a bunch of government agencies. But the idea is nuclear and radioactive materials out of control, out of regulatory control, are bad, and there's usually going to be a legal context and framework that's associated with 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 uh, investigating any material that's found that way. So nuclear forensics is a discipline in which we try to answer a several questions related to material outside of regulatory control. A lot of people that, that talk about this will talk about WORC, which is the acronym for nuclear and radioactive material outside of regulatory material outside of regulatory control. Work. Um, I don't like to say it except that I just have said it because it's kind of a fun it's a fun word to say. And there's there's a few of those that we'll come up with. But anyway, so we like to answer what is the material? Um, a lot of times, uh, customers, those could be the FBI or the, the other government agencies, will bring us material and just say, what is this? So that's a basic, basic question that we try to answer. What was the intended use? How was the material produced? Or where was it produced? When was it last reprocessed? Or rather, last processed? How old is it? Um, where the material was used, produced, or stored within a state? And then finally, who's associated with the material? 
So can you think of an example of, of a, a forensic investigation where they wanted to know who's associated with the material? What's an example of a who's associated with radioactive material? Yeah, all the, the mail devices. Sure, if those I've read, you want to know who had it before. Yeah, there's a pretty famous case that happened in the UK a couple of years back. You know, a uh, spy was killed by I guess a figure with the isotope was. Yeah, so <laughs> they're not going to just say, oh, it's some radioactive material. It's attempting to poison somebody and let it go, right? They're going to try to figure out where it was. So there's a lot of evidence contaminated with radionuclides that that was tracked down as a part of that investigation. Okay, so the whole idea is finding forensically useful or forensically important links between things. It could be between contaminated evidence and the bulk material that did the contamination. It could be linking multiple cases that are separated in space and time, but might might be considering similar material. It could be linking a nuclear material with technical specifications. In other words, if a country says we only enrich uranium to 2%, um, and then you find somebody smuggling material that's enriched to 4%, you might be able to compare that material and say this isn't consistent with the state's holdings. And that could be important. And finally, um, linking radioactive sources to a specific supplier can be important for, um, for some types of investigations. So the main idea is that when nuclear or radioactive material is found outside of regulatory control, we'd like to be able to answer the question, is it ours? Like, the US wants to answer this question, is it our material? But if many other countries also need to be able to answer that question. Because depending on whose material it is, that is going to dictate the government response, right? If we find something out of regulatory control and we say, oh, that's ours, that came from, you know, let's see, it's not Berkeley, obviously, uh, that came from Irvine. You know, we won't worry, we're not going to go bomb Irvine, right? But on the other hand, if we say, oh, that came from um, somewhere else land, we may take military action against somewhere else land. So knowing where material is from is very important. So how do we do that? I'm going to use a lot of analogies in these talks because um, I don't like equations because I'm a geologist. So here, here's my analogy. It's, it's about a tennis ball. Basically, the things I can measure about a nuclear material or, or radioactive material, most of the stuff I work on is nuclear, is, um, is characteristics. So these are things I can measure. They could be the isotopic composition, the major elements, microstructure, morphology, age dating. So if I were going to measure the forensically useful characteristics about a tennis ball, I might say, well, I'm going to check out the diameter, the circumference, look at the color maybe, the texture, they're kind of fuzzy how bouncy they are, the chemical composition, those are the characteristics, all the stuff I can measure about a tennis ball. But if I wanted to find a signature, that's a characteristic that's actually preserved through changes to that material. So as material, for instance, if you think of a nuclear material as it transits the nuclear fuel cycle, if you're thinking about a tennis ball, what happens when it gets left at the dog park for a little while, right? So some things are still important, the circumference, these characteristic markings, the diameter, the chemical composition maybe is the same, but all of a sudden the color is not the same, the texture is not the same, the bounciness is not the same. One thing that I can't measure but I can surmise from, from having a vast experience with tennis balls is the intended use. Um, so when I think about nuclear material, I'm always thinking about developing signatures, <laughs> and particularly signatures that persist across the fuel cycle. So. You can imagine a number of steps of the nuclear fuel cycle, and I imagine a lot of this group probably has a tattoo of this on their back. <laughs> fuel cycle, um, right? You can imagine material starts as, as ore, uranium ore that's mined out of the ground. Uh, it's concentrated into a uranium ore concentrated powder. It's being tra uh, transformed to U3. It's converted to uranium hexafluoride eventually. Uh, Maybe it's enriched, it's in a gas cylinder, it goes back to UO2, maybe it makes some pellets, and then that goes into a fuel assembly, et cetera. So in each of these steps, there's going to be certain, sig certain signatures that are associated with the material, and some of those do persist quite nicely through the fuel cycle. Um, and, yeah. and I'll also add that different materials have different characteristics, or different forensic signatures that are important. Different characteristics that we can measure are different signatures. So uh, my research actually focuses a lot on uranium ore concentrate, um, and there's a lot of different a lot of different characteristics you can measure. 
all kinds of trace elements, isotopes, etc. And many of those in combination form signatures that can help to determine the provenance of a material. How many people know what provenance is? Okay, anybody else? Okay, great. Provenance is a fancy word for where it came from. So I want to be able to pick up a jar of yellow cake be able to say where it came from, what mine made this material. So that's what I mean when I say provenance assessment. Radioactive sealed sources have a whole different set of, of signatures that are important. And since this is just about the only time I'm going to talk about radioactive sources, I'll ask you. Now, what do you think some signatures of a radioactive source might be? What, what might you want to check? If, if, if you know they look kind of like that. Chemo spectrum. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. What else? Okay, I'll help you out. You want to just measure it, just the dimensions. You want to see if there's a serial number marking on there. You want to see the size. The, that kind of thing is what you're looking for from sources. It's a totally different set of signatures than what I'm looking for in yellow cake. Um, so the idea is that characteristics are a bunch of things you can measure, but if you put them together, you package them together, they can create a signature that can be used to inform nuclear forensic findings. So for instance, if I measure the enrichment, the dimensions, the impurities, maybe grand size to distribution of these uh, cylindrical objects, um, I might be able to determine that they are, you know, UO2 fuel pellets from, that were not yet irradiated. They were never actually part of a fuel assembly. They might go to a PWR, um, and before you scratch your head and you say, wait, those are annular pellets, they can't possibly go to a PWR, they're actually tungsten weights for something else. It's just a stock photo, so it's cool. <laughs> Don't freak out. Okay, um, but you might be able to link that also to similar sample seized in a recent case. The idea about signatures is that they're tied to the questions that are being asked. So, for instance, um, if the question that's being asked is, is this LEU powder in this picture from an LWR fuel production plant, I might be able to do some analyses and say the chemical form is consistent, yes. The enrichment is 4.3%, that's what we would expect. Trace elements are not going to be super helpful. That's not going to tell you if it's from a PWR plant or not. On the other hand, if I'm trying to tell if it's from the triangle fuel plant or the square plant, then the chemical form isn't going to be that informative, right? I CO2 is probably for, what, for such a planet. And the enrichment might not be telling, but the trace elements could be helpful in that case. So in general, we're developing nuclear forensics findings um, using a few different things. Information on the location and characteristics of the material. And that's actually the big area of my research, is just understanding what characteristics and signatures are forensically useful. Um, we also require expertise in the identification of materials, just being able to answer the what, what is it question. Um, we need a mechanism for com making comparative assessments. So this can be uh, simple statistical tools, and it can, can range to rather complex multivariate algorithms and things that are used. And finally, uh, we talk about a framework for communication because this is the government, and so it's actually a thing that we have to sort of codify. Right, an ability to communicate with investigators and make sure that we're actually addressing the questions in order to answer the um, answer the investigative needs. Okay, so I'm going to speak now a little bit about comparative assessments and data evaluation. So we talk about sort of three main ways of doing comparative assessments, and um, they all involve chickens. Okay, so I talk about a point-to-point -point comparison. That's where I have a direct comparator sample. I want to know, is the material seized in this case similar to that case? So I measure a bunch of characteristics in, in material that was seized previously. I measure the same characteristics in the material that was seized now, and just do a comparison and say, are they the same or not? Um, but you don't always have a comparator sample, and in fact, most of the time, you probably don't. Most of the time, you're doing what we call a point to population comparison. That's where I have the material that uh, was recently seized, and I have a whole bunch of production records from a plant that produced similar material. 
and I want to say, is it similar to the sort of population of data representing that material? And then finally, there's a certain amount of modeling that goes on as well. For some things, we don't have a ton of samples. For example, irradiated fuel is not something that we have a huge library of compositions, so we would use models in, in a case like that. I'll begin by talking about point-to-point -point comparisons. And um, again, if you have two comparative samples, you can then pretty clearly rule out that this chicken is not like the others. And in order to make this work, I need a whole database of comparative uranium ore concentrate samples. And so uh, in order to do that, we've actually built a little more of the uranium sourcing database. Um, and that is a database with over 3,000 comparator samples. So these are uranium ore concentrates from all over the world that people send me. It is actually sort of parenthetically, I'll say, part of my job to call up uranium suppliers and say, hi. I'm a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore. I'm not anymore, but it helps if you say that. Hi, I'm a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore. Would you send me some uranium or concentrate for my database? And lo and behold, they often do send these out. Um, but we build the database in a few other ways, too. It's not just me pretending to be a postdoc. <laughs> anyway, this big database, so over 3,000 samples, 150,000 analytical results, um, several hundred uh, different unique locations are represented in the database. And so if I get an unknown uranium ore concentrate, I can pretty easily make a comparison to what's in the database. Um, typically, an exact match isn't possible, but it is possible to sort of narrow it down to a certain population of data points. Um, and again, we use a lot of statistics, uh, PLS in some cases, but also um, some other you know, math things. Uh, we use partially squared differential analysis and a few other things. Okay, so uranium ore concentrate is yellow cake. Those are interchangeable. I just thought it was kind of a cool picture. This is actually rescued out of the basement at Stanford. Um, a professor retired and they found that in the office. <laughs> we call it the spice rack. Okay, so by now I'm sure you're thinking, well, wait a second, trafficking of yellow cake, that's not even a thing. Who cares about yellow cake? It's like, what, 80% uranium, it's yellow, it's messy, it's not dangerous at all, right? It's a thing, as it turns out. There's been a few cases, well, you can't really read them, but suffice it to say that there have been a few recent cases where yellow cake has been trafficked. And um, so that's why we keep track of it. The other nice thing about yellow cake is that it's typically not really terribly sensitive. It's sensitive to the suppliers in the um, business confidential sense, that's proprietary compositionally usually, but it's not classified. And so it's a great way to develop our algorithms and start to understand signature development and the metrics. Okay, so in, uh, in a lot of my research, I work on understanding impurity, impurity signatures of yellow cake and trying to tie material back to its, its uh, point of origin. Um, and so I can share that a few of the signatures that we found to be really useful are some of the stable, um, or some of the radiogenic isotopes, so uranium isotopics. Which, uh, which uranium isotopes do you think I am interested in? What's the one that, that might vary in nature that might be useful? OAT. That's not a uranium isotope, oh. but it is an isotope that's important. <laughs> yeah, it's easier than uranium. <laughs> so that one varies a lot, yeah. What else? What's a uranium isotope ratio that I would care about? 235. 235, okay, but if it's natural uranium. 238. Still natural. <laughs> 234 is what I'm looking for. Yeah, so I, I look at variations in 234 because there, because there, there are some natural variations. There is actually a slightly detectable variation in 235, 238 ratio, but you have to, it's difficult to measure. So, um, well, 236 is the one that's really interesting. That means it's, it's been reprocessed. 236 would tell you it was reprocessed, but for your any more concentrate, it's. Hopefully. Unless they convert it back to yellow cake, which they could. Which they could. So have we ever seen U308 that has 236 present? Yes, absolutely. Most of the time we don't see 236. Most of the time 235, 238 doesn't vary within uh, the ability to make a measurement quickly. So if we did a double spike and really spent our time, we can see some variation, but generally um, we're looking at 480. 
Uh, we also see strontium isotopic variation, and in this case I'm looking at strontium 87 to the 86 ratio. Um, that is related to the age of the ore body, and so that has some variation that can be correlated uh, regionally. It works kind of nicely. Uh, neodymium is a similar story. You do see sulfur, oxygen, um, nitrogen, and, and um, carbon isotopic variations, depending on what kind of processing was used to make the material. Um, trace elements can also be important, especially rare earth elements. We'll talk about those a little bit. Anions can point to what reagents were used in the production. Uh, which compound was, was produced? Is it AEU? Is it U308? Is it uranium peroxide? Uh, it turns out in the US, we're only making U308 and uranium peroxide right now. So if I find a jar of ADU at the Alameda County swap meet, which happened, and it's ADU, I can say either it's very old from when we were still making ADU or it's not from here. Hint, it was very old from somebody's garage. Okay, uh, certain organic compounds are also can be telling as well as morphology. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about rare earth elements. Most rare earth elements are trivalent cations. They're really convenient because they behave similarly. They stick together um, through chemical processing, which means that the rare earth element pattern of a uranium ore rock that I dig out of the ground is going to be preserved in the uranium ore concentrate. So that's the kind of signature I like, the kind that are preserved. Um, okay, europium and cerium have additional valencies besides the three plus, and so they can fractionate differently than the rest of the rare earths, which is really convenient. So, different, we've found that different types of uranium ore deposit have different rare earth element patterns. So these are patterns that are measured. Um, what it is is a big ratio of the concentration of rare earth element to chondrite. Anybody know what a chondrite is? It's a meteorite from space. The reason we use it is, is it's just a normalizing ratio. It's sort of so that we have a benchmark. What matters is not the absolute concentration of rare earth elements, it's actually the relative concentration. It's the, the ratio, it's the relative concentration. And so it doesn't matter how high or low you are, I'm looking at the shape of these patterns. These are the rare earth elements across the uh, X axis here, and we're just looking at the variation. So you can see the quartz pebble conglomerates all kind of have a similar shape. They've got a nice dip here. That's what we call the europium anomaly. Um, some of these other have a nice sweep up. Uh, and you can see a few other variations here. And those are all in uranium ore concentrates, right? So not the ores, but the ore concentrates. So I did a project a few years ago looking at a suite of 34 uranium ore concentrates from a uh, known location. We believe them to be a time series, as in these were 34 samples collected over a period of many years, 10-ish years. Um, and one of the things I looked at is the rare earth element concentrations from them. So the first thing I can tell you is that this turquoise swoopy thing here, that's the patterns from the first, the early samples. So you'll notice they have a high, higher concentrations because they're higher up, but they're the same shape as the later ones. Um, the later ore concentrates have a similar pattern, a little bit lower concentration. So what do I know? I know all those 34 samples are likely to be from the same facility. I know the processing probably got better. The early ones, they were not as good at removing rare earth elements. They got better at removing rare elements, rare earth elements as time went on. And then I know what kind of deposit it came from. Because remember, I had that nice figure I just showed a second ago? Right? There it is. OK, keep that in your brain. What kind of deposit is it from? Yeah! Nice job. That's right. Go team. OK, yeah. So they're from phosphory deposits with improving processing over time, over 10 years. Cool, right? Okay, but that's not enough to just compare things. I'm going to compare this thing to that. I want to do something a little better. I want to be able to predict. So if I find this egg, I want to be able to tie it back to the chicken that laid it. If I find this egg, I want to tie it back to the chicken that laid it. So one really great predictive signature. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> oh. One really great predictive signature, sorry, it gets less interesting again, no more chicken, chickens and rabbits, um, is with radiochronometry. So radiochronometry, 
um, is a way to capture the model age of a material, when it was last processed, or, or how old the material is. Uh, so for the comparative signatures that I had been talking about, no assumptions are particularly required. But for, a, for this predictive signature, for the age of a material, I need to make a couple of assumptions. First, that the sample was completely purified at, at the last time it was purified, and then it has remained a closed system, so no isotopes have been added since the last time it was processed. There's a few different chronometers that, um, that we use. These are some of the uranium series chronometers. Uh, we refer to the, the first isotope as the parent, middle one is the daughter, and then there are grand, granddaughters that we talk about too, and the various half-lives are here. So this is a, a chart. It shows the commonly used radium chronometers. So most common, uranium thorium. We do it for almost every sample of nuclear forensic interest. It's also a really common radio chronometer for the geologists in the house. Um, plutonium americium is also another good one. We run, we use that a lot, but what, what thing that the sample has to have is? Plutonium. You have to have plutonium in order to use the plutonium chronometer. So it's not a really great one for material that has uh, not been in a reactor. Uh, there's a couple less common radio chronometers, and then there's this uh, little box of rarely used ones. Those are those are radio chronometers that are undergoing active research campaigns that are, we're, we're working on a lot. So they're based, the uh, radio chronometers are based on a couple of um, equations. So the basically the radioactive decay equations can um, calculate the amount of parent present at, time, at a particular time. You can calculate the amount of daughter that's present at particular time, and combining it all up, you can express the age of the material based on the ratio of the parent to daughter that you measure. And the great thing about mass spectrometry and the kind of work I do is that we can measure this. So we can measure the parent-daughter ratio, and then we can figure out how old we use. Here's a plot that shows the year on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the thorium-uranium ratio, and it's linear, and it's where you get to just measure that ratio. And it's just, oh, there it is. You can figure it out. It's awesome. Works great. OK, so what could be a problem? I got really excited there, but there's like maybe one thing that could like kind of mess this up. It's about the assumptions. Anybody remember the assumptions? No, we passed. OK, here, so nothing's happened to it since the last time it was processed, right? Mm -hmm. Or that something was so something could have been added, or it wasn't completely purified. So what that tells me is that the age that I'm calculating is not necessarily a true age of the material. What it is is it's a model age. It's the oldest the sample can possibly be, because often the last processing step wasn't 100% complete. So one way we kind of uh, try to account for this problem is that we'll measure a couple of different radio chronometers on the material of interest. And hopefully we'll get some concordant chronometry. Meaning I've got a couple of different radio chronometers that all give me the same age. So then I feel pretty good that I can, I can say when I think it was last produced. OK. So enough about radio chronometry. Let's talk about a couple of case studies. How many people have heard about the Bulgaria case? Yeah, I'm really sorry to do this to you because I know that this is the case that if you've ever heard a talk about nuclear forensics, you're going to hear about the Bulgaria case. Does anybody know why we talk about the Bulgaria case so much? It's not classified. <laughs> it's the one we get to talk about. But it's still kind of a cool case. So. There are these two seizures of, new, of highly enriched uranium, HEU, that were separated by about two years and 1,500 miles. Um, first was a small HEU ampule interdicted in Bulgaria in 1999. It was interdicted at a border crossing. The story behind this is actually kind of interesting. Okay, so this guy was driving his car. He was coming from Turkey, driving through the border checkpoint of Bulgaria, and he gets stopped by the border control agent. Because the border guard looked to where he'd been and said, you've been in Turkey, 
your car is too clean. There are no fast food wrappers here. Something is up. You have been on a long road trip. It's not possible that your car would be this clean. And that's why he gets stopped. They search the car, and the border guard must have been like super, super diligent because it's not like a radiation portal alarm was set off or anything like that. What a car or something? And looks at the air compressor, and there's some tape on it. So he starts peeling back the tape on the air compressor, and inside the air compressor, lo and behold, the guts of the air compressor have been removed, and is a lead pig. And in the lead pig is the vial of HEU. This is the weirdest story. Okay. <laughs> About two years later, in Paris, the police were actually operating on a tip, in this case, and they said, we think there's something there. And they found this lead pig with an ampule of HEU. Looks a little bit similar, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so the question was, are these two connected? We can use nuclear forensics to find out. Okay. So, what the alteration is, the packing materials are remarkably similar. And we don't just mean they're remarkably similar, like look, they both have yellow stuff in them, and they both have glass ampules, and you know, the, the pigs are both made of lead. They actually did some anal chemical analysis of the wax. The wax is the same. Um, in fact, I did the analysis of the ampule and was able to determine that the glass, which is a borosilicate glass, was compositionally identical in the two ampules. Um, they, do I believe we did lead isotopes on the, on the uh, pigs as well. And again, those are consistent. Uh, uranium isotopic compositions are also identical. So this plot shows a ratio of the Bulgaria sample to the Paris seizure for 234, 235, 238, and 236. And the line across the middle is a is a one-to-one -one for them being uh, exactly equal and lo and behold they are isotopically nearly identical. Um, trace element composition is really similar as well. Gosh, they are similar. Uh, one thing that's different, though, and that is the radio chronometry. The appearance process. <laughs> okay. So the the uh, both samples had uh, uranium two thirty six present, um, and the Bulgarian the Bulgarian sample had a, a last processing age of nineteen ninety three. The French sample had one of nineteen ninety five. That would seem to indicate that those two are maybe different batches or something like that, right? Except, and here's the kicker, they were both measured in different laboratories with different standards. So it is possible that those ages are actually closer than this. We were not able to measure the France sample in Livermore, so we don't have the analyses that are identical. Or, um, analytically comparable, but uh, at least it looks like they're, they're quite similar. So what we determined was that uh, the samples were consistent in terms of isotopics. Uh, well, here it says no on the trace elements, but I think that's uh, Trace element concentrations were quite similar. Material model age is different outside of analytical uncertainty, but possibly that's because of the difference in where they were measured. And finally, we were able to estimate an irradiation in the industry, which I did not show, but suffice it to say, they're similar. So we believe these samples are linked. How many people think that there might have been another case? Is it possible? Yeah, we found more of this stuff, which is a bummer, because while I'm not that worried about people trafficking in yellow cake, right, it's kind of messy and heavy and whatever, but you're not going to make a nuclear weapon with yellow cake. I am kind of worried about HEU. It's 93% enriched HEU. Not great to have a oh. oh, sorry, 76% on Yeah, you can't make a bomb of that stuff. Well, you could be 50 tons of material in water. Right. No, that's true. But that's, I am more worried about HEU being. Well, and, and the thing is that what the, the fact that your ampules gives the way because those are, that's the format you'd use if you had an analysis lab on the side of reprocessing. So yeah, that's right. those are different batches. That's it's probably sub fuel from the Russians. Okay, I'm gonna show another picture of chicken. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is uh, that there's a fair amount of points of model comparisons where we don't have comparator model comparator materials, and clearly that's going to be really dependent on how good our models are. So in fact, we do have lots of nuclear engineers that work in our, on our team and in with our group, and, and you can see that if I were comparing this chicken to a really nicely made model, it might be pretty easy to make a comparison, but if I compare it to a drawing by my seven-year-old, I'm not sure you'd be able to say they were consistent. Okay, so nuclear forensics is super exciting. We link material with people and places and processes and locations. Um, typically, there is a lot of signature development work, and the signatures are tied to the question being asked. The value of the different signatures depends a lot on the um, on the questions that are being asked by the investigative authority. So, a lot of times we're interacting with the investigative authority, sometimes to help guide questions, and sometimes to um, help them know what to ask. Uh, comparative, we use a number of different comparative analyses techniques, everything from crazy statistics to reactor modeling and um, looking at old textbooks from the 1950s. It's a whole range of different methods that we're using. Um, the last piece I'll use is that expert interpretation is a really important part of what we do and we call on a lot of experts with a lot of process knowledge to help us in drawing our nuclear forensics conclusions because it turns out a database is not enough. You actually need somebody that knows what they're talking about. Okay. Here's a disclaimer. <laughs> Please read and memorize this. <laughs> the pictures are, um, that is a joke, but I've been told that I have to include that now in every talk I give. The, one of the cool parts of my job is that I travel all over the world um, talking about nuclear forensics um, and libraries, and uh, so those are some pictures of travels this year. So, anyway, thanks. Versus like neutron activation analysis. How do you go through that uh, process? Okay, so we don't do NAA at all. Okay. Like, um, most of the time, what we will do, depending on sort of the ratio of our elements to other stuff in the sample, uh, mostly we'll just digest the sample and run it either by a quadruple ICPMS or um, sometimes by a single collector sector, sector field instrument. Sometimes we will do a separation of the rare earth elements first in order, um, for example, if it's something that's, you know, very high concentration of uranium and we don't want to put that much uranium in the instrument, we'll, we'll separate the rare earth elements. And there have been a few people doing, uh, doing some investigations into HPLC for doing better separations of rare earth elements. So, like online HPLC connected directly to the spec. That's the HPLC piece, I think, is more in development than standard. Could you comment on, uh, you have in your slides, uh, but how important is microstructure associated with what you find, and and how uh, does the structure of the material and uh, local trace elements relate to each other in, in this kind of work? Yeah, so that's complicated. So different pellet, for example, in fuel pellets, different pellet manufacturers have different specifications for, for grain size um, and also impurities and things. And so we can look at grain size distribution and sometimes tell about where, where the material is produced. In terms of trace elements, we definitely see zonation in trace elements along grain boundaries in fuel pellets particularly. Um, sometimes you can see deformation of grains. So you can see a preferred, a preferred orientation and it can understand some kind of shear or other process that's affecting it. Um, recently I worked on, on a sample that had an extremely fine, surprisingly fine grain size. Um, and so that was 
likely indicative that the material was, um, you know, that the, the, the object was not meeting the specifications for a particular reactor. You say, well, the grain size is just not that. Um, that's kind of the grain size distribution stuff. Other materials have morphology characteristics like grain more concentrates. We'll have variations in morphology depending on what um, reagents are used for precipitating the, the um, yellow cake. Um, you can distinguish uh, your ADUs from, from uranium peroxides and things like that and different, different process factors based on the grain size and, and in morphology, whether they're sort of elongating crystals or ground. Uh, so, I guess, it is a it's important component of, of identifying how something was made and where it came from in several cases. Is that what you're yeah, I think that's fair to say in several cases. I mean, just like all of the signatures, they sort of depend on each particular material, whether that's going to be important or not. But uh, I would say that I always look at grain size. It might not be interesting, but I generally always look at it. Yeah. Not only, I think that the, the comparison, of course, depending on your database. So you will capture, let's say on uranium ore, you have different places producing those uranium different. Yeah. Does the database including uranium from seawater? Or has any of, have you, do you know whether this uranium from seawater will be looked different from terrestrial uranium? Um. You knew how many times I've been asked this? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but you know. No, I mean, there's there's been a surprising amount of interest in this question. Uh, we don't currently have samples of uranium produced from seawater in the uranium sourcing database. I have been trying to get my hands on some of the material that Oak Ridge was working on a few years back, but they have um, the high I'm a postdoc from Livermore thing doesn't work with other DOE labs. <laughs> so, uh, it, I'd be interested to look at it. I have in the past made some predictions on what I think it would look like, but mainly I, I, I tend to think it wouldn't look like much because it's so cost prohibitive that I don't know who would do it. Sure. Not a concern now, but in it's, some future, who knows? And how can you tell which uranium belongs to who if you come from seawater? <laughs> right, well, if it comes to that, I think I mean, if, if you've seen the pilot scale plants for producing uranium from seawater, they're so big that you can look at a satellite photo and see who it came from. <laughs> that, that, that would be my thought, if, if you had any of any importance. Well, there's no shortage of uranium fuel right now. Downlanding Russian weapons and doing all kinds of things, and just you have a blood on the mind. Right. <laughs> and, and actually, so I attend these uranium uh, producers' conferences, and, and Mostly, I find that uranium producers curse the DOE because we have flooded the market with so much downloaded material that really driven prices down. So, yeah, I don't, I don't see the seawater thing happening yet. There are other, there are other sort of non-traditional sources of UOC that I think are more likely to get tapped before seawater, like some of the black shales and things. Yeah. So I don't know if there would be a need to know this sort of like to ever know this sort of thing, but I'm wondering if there are any indicators for uranium that are robust enough that you could measure them and still infer something about them even after the radiation. Uh, so there, I mean, there's. Yeah, I, I think, sure, that would be the holy grail signature if you had something that you could measure in uranium ore concentrate and then take the irradiated fuel rod out of the reactor and, you know, pop it in a instrument that would tell you that same thing. I don't know what that would be yet, but there's certainly plenty of research and, 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 and work that's been done on irradiated fuel elements, for instance, that look at what the different characteristics are and they can tell you about how long it's been in the reactor, and what position it was in, and what position in the pin it was in, that kind of thing. But it's not the same as a signature that, that translates all the way through. Yeah, we'd love to have that, and actually the IEA puts out calls about every two or three years looking for that signature that goes all the way through, but I haven't seen that yet. We can't even get GE to tell us the diameter of their fuel. <laughs> <laughs> 